Good morning, good morning. It's so good to see every one of your smiling faces this morning. Uh, it's so good to be back at um, Mission Point Community Church. It's been a week 
but I just feel like it's been a lifetime because I love being here. I love being with my church. Uh, by the way, my name is Dalton Locke. I'm a member here at Mission Point Community Church, and I just want to humbly ask you all that you can, or tell you all that you can have a seat, <laughs> because I forgot to say that when I first walked up. <laughs> um, like I said, my name is Dalton Locke, and I am a member here at Mission Point Community Church, and I just wanted to share a few things with you. Uh, one, I went, wanted to remind you that we are all thinking of who our one is going to be, and who that one is is that person that we're going to be praying for uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, so just be, uh, be thinking about who you want to be praying for, who that one specific person is that you want to come to know Christ or to come back to Christ. Um, we're talking about Jonah right now, who is, uh, quote unquote, the prodigal prophet. He, uh, he's the one who ran away from God when God had something for him to do. Um, because God has something um, in store for all of humanity, and that is common grace. Uh, he constantly gives it out. And for the city of Nineveh, he had common grace. He wanted, he, they weren't his chosen people, but he wanted them to repent. He wanted them to experience his grace. And so I just want to keep that all in mind. And, um, but I also want to remind you that um, to pray for that one, but also uh, that we value prayer here at Mission Point. Uh, prayer is something that we hold to a high standard, and we, uh, we gather together to worship in song and in prayer, but also to um, commune with the Father in an, in an attitude of humility. Um, so just be keeping that in mind as we pray today, as we worship today. Um, another thing that I'd like to ask you to pray for is for those of us that are going on the Dominican Republic trip. Uh, we're going on mission down there, Stephen Reed, um, myself, and then Pastor, or <laughs> mixed all that up, Elder, Pastor Stephen Reed, Elder Doug and Janice Campbell. Um, just be, keep them in your prayers. And uh, Let's continue in worship uh, through the scripture reading. So if you all would stand with me, we're going to be in Psalm. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have told you of my ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. Amen, amen. Now let's continue to worship in song. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, because I feel just like a lost cause. I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands. With arms open, our arms, and you tell me nothing. I could separate my heart from the God who stays. You used to hide every time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way. I'm learning you don't work that way. Somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still Hey. 
Well, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to join with me in the book of Jonah. That's where we've been for the last few weeks. That's where we're going to continue today. And again, if you haven't been with us, just go to the middle of your Bible and go to the right a little bit or just scroll on your phone a little bit past Psalms and you will find the book of Jonah. And I always encourage you because I want you to see in your own copy of Scripture, not just what's on the screen so that you can follow along and make sure again that I'm not making anything up. So Jonah chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. And as you're finding Jonah chapter 3, I'm excited. I'm excited to say that my family is here with me today. This is my mom and my dad and my brother and his girlfriend, Julie. So we're excited to have them with us today. You be sure to let them know that you're happy that they're here. And I was thinking about the fact that they are here today, that uh, I am the youngest of three boys. And so I had my two older brothers kind of paved the way. Those of you with the baby of the family, you know what I'm talking about. They did things that I learned from that I was like, I won't do that. That's probably not a good idea. And uh, what I found was that, believe it or not, as precious as I am, there were moments that I still got into trouble. I still did things that I shouldn't. And so from time to time, uh, every now and then, my, my, my father or my, my, my mom would come to me and they would talk to me. They would speak to me. And there was this air of authority because that's mom and that's dad and that's a good thing. And I don't know about you, but as parents and for those of you, or you, you all have parents, uh, you're here. And so um, <laughs> when the parent speaks, hopefully the child is listening. And there's a difference of like, I can listen, but I'm not really paying attention to what it is that you're having to say. I know none of you ever did that to your parents. And as you listen to them, the parent is expecting some kind of response back from you, and hopefully not a smart aleck response back from you. That's what they're expecting. And so when they speak, they expect a response. We offer that response. But you know what never really flew in, in my household is if my dad spoke to me about a specific issue or maybe some need of discipline in my life that I would listen, I would respond, and then I'd go, thanks, dad. And then I would just make my way on about my day. He got the last word. Mom and dad always get the last word. They're the one in authority. They're the ones who are now saying, yes, you have responded to what I've had to say. Now it's my turn to respond to what you said back to me. I end the conversation. And that's exactly what we're going to see here today is this idea of, of God speaking, we responding, and then God says, okay, here's my response to your response. And so uh, to give a little bit of context, if you, if you haven't been with us, just this idea that in, back in Jonah chapter 1, God spoke. And when God spoke to Jonah, he said, I want you to rise, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to do that. He literally went the opposite direction. Nineveh was this way. He said, I'm going to get on a boat and go to Tarshish, which was Spain. I'm going to go that way, complete opposite end of the world to get away from what God is asking me uh, to do. So God does what God always does. We have the tendency to run from God and the things of God. God and just who he is, he has the tendency to pursue us to chase us down because he loves us. And he does this through a storm in Jonah chapter one. And then last week we saw that he continued to pursue and save Jonah through a fish. And so here he is, God pursuing Jonah. And Jonah has this wonderful, if you will, come to Jesus meeting in the belly of this fish. And then Jonah prays a prayer of desperation. He prays this prayer of deliverance. God hears Jonah's prayer. And he has the big, ugly fish in Jonah chapter 2 at the end, vomit Jonah on dry land. And I thought about starting today's sermon with a vomit story, but I didn't think we needed that because that's just, you know, a little bit too much. But if you want to know some, I got a several uh, from the dentist. I, I, I hate going to the dentist. But I think we can all agree, as awful as it is to vomit, can you imagine how much more awful it would be to be vomited? And that's what Jonah has experienced here. And yet... This is the means of his salvation. I remind you, as we talked about last week, sometimes when we experience the grace of God in our life to deliver us, sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable, but we still experience the goodness and the grace of God. And so now we're in Jonah chapter three. Look at verse one. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. If you're taking notes, the first thing I want us to simply see is God, God speaks. Again, for those of you that have been with us, or if you're familiar with the Jonah story, verses one and two should sound incredibly familiar to you because it's almost verbatim what you read in Jonah chapter one 
where it says in Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and he said, arise and go to Nineveh. It's almost the exact same thing, except just a, a little bit of a nuance, a little bit of a difference, because it says that God spoke to Jonah a second time. Jonah receives a second chance. That is good news to hear for me. I hope that that is good news for you to hear, that our God is a God of second chances. And honestly, third chances and fourth chances of where we continue to have those areas, especially those areas that we know this is a standard or a guideline or a statute of God and his word. And we continue just to say, but I'd rather do this or I'd rather do that. The, the beauty of what we see here with Jonah is that Jonah, he gets this second chance. But what we find is that he's obviously not too far gone. Can I remind you where you sit today? I don't know what it is that you are doing or what it is that your eyes have seen or what your hands have touched that you know was not uh, in accordance to God and his will and to his word, but you're not too far gone wherever you are in this life. You're just not too far gone. God continues to come after you and to pursue you, and he will give you because he is a good and gracious God, a God of second chance. God always initiates God always initiates because our God is a God of revelation. When, when we talk about Scripture, the reality of Scripture is that this is God's Word, and sometimes you might hear the term God's revelation to us. Now, I'm not talking about the book of Revelation at the end of your Bible. That, that is a part of His whole revelation. But God's Word is Him revealing Himself to us and how we can come to know Him. And what I, one of the things that I want to stress to you is that when God's and the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, we don't want to just skip over that. We want to recognize that, again, God is initiating the conversation and the movement into Jonah's life. Because when God speaks, things change and people change. God's word is key to our lives as our individual, as individuals, and also our existence as a church, specifically here at Mission Point. When the word of God shows up along with the person of the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but what I've seen is that people change, communities change, cultures change, countries change. At Mission Point, we believe that this is not just simply some kind of old book, but this is God's eternal word. It's timeless, therefore it is always timely. We don't want to take the word of God and then have this idea that it's going to change according to the shifting tides of opinion or culture or preference or some kind of new interpretation because we're not in authority over God's word. None of us are. We are to submit under the authority of God's word. We don't have the right to edit it. We don't have the right to go, I like this part, don't like that part, I want to pull that out. What we do is we come under the submission of the word of God and we say, I'm going to read it, I'm going to study it, and I'm going to obey it because we're not called to be editors. We're called to be messengers of the Word of God. Every single one of us, whether you are a pastor or whether you are an elder or whether you are a deacon or whether you are a missionary, and as Doug would remind us, we're all missionaries here at Mission Point. All of us, we are to be messengers of the Word of God because God's Word is what people need to hear. I was reminded just this week of just listening to some mentors in my life, and what you don't need to hear is some clever story of how I vomited at the dentist's office. What you need to hear is God's Word, because God's Word will change your life. My stories of my life aren't going to change your life, so we want to be students of this Word, because this is what's going to change us when we submit to its authority in our life, because we don't want to just simply be studious and just get fat on, on and taking in the Word. We want to examine the Word, but the beauty of the Word of God is this. When you come to it in submission, it's not that you're examining the Word of God. The Word of God begins to examine you. In the book of Isaiah, we're reminded of, of when Isaiah comes into the presence of God, it's almost as if the spotlight of God is just focused there on Isaiah. It's like this x-ray machine of revealing who Isaiah really is. And he comes to this point when he looks at God and God's standards, that's when he recognizes, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. We need the word of God in our life to examine us and to reveal who we are and what we desperately need. We want to be a people here at Mission Point that when we hear the word of God, we would receive the word of God, submit to the word of God, obey the word of God, because when that happens, again, people change. You change, I change. 
Our destiny changes. Our eternity changes. Your family changes. Can I tell you this? If you will be a student and submissive to the Word of God in your life, you will leave a legacy that will forever be altered. That for some of you, there might be just a moment today where you will say, as for me in my life, I'm going to be a student and submissive to the Word of God. And as a result of this, you don't even know that it's about to happen. For, for some of you, maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you don't have children yet. But what you're going to do is you're saying now, long before any of that shows up, I'm beginning a legacy that I will be a man or woman of the Word, and it will forever change the legacy of your family for generations to come, even if they don't know your name, because you're great, great, great grandpa to them. But you started the legacy that we will be a man, but we will be a family, that we will be a, a generation of the Word. So, I add that before we go into anything else because, again, we could look over the Bible. We could look over the fact that God speaks to us. The creator of the cosmos, of the heavens and the earth, saw fit in his graciousness to speak to you through his word. And yet we will casually throw it to the side and we'll say, but maybe I could find something in the lyric of a song that will really speak to me that will really move me. Those are great and fine, but nothing is a substitute for the authority and the need of God speaking into your life. Amen. You need this word. It is your bread. It is necessary for you. Well, one of the most interesting things, one of our, one of our young adults, I was visiting with him, and he goes, he goes, Stephen, he said, sometimes when you preach, he said, it's just a little bit different because uh, I've been in, in preaching where before where someone's going to, you know, have an idea and then find a passage that kind of supports the idea and then talk about, you know, five ways to love your cat. And it's just like, oh, how's that going to help me in, in, in dealing with the realities of life? And he said, seems like when you preach, your desire is to read the text and then preach the text and then pull out of the text what the text says and to apply that. And I'm like, Yes, that's exactly what it is that we're wanting to do because I don't have anything to say. He has what we need to say. So let's hear from him and study him and submit to this authority. And so here's Jonah, or excuse me, here's God in verse 2 telling Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh. You got your second chance. Proclaim to that city the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Now he added that from chapter 1. It's almost as if he's talking to his wayward child. And I just kind of envision him having glasses on at this moment. And he looks over his glasses like, now you tell him what I say to tell. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. You do what I tell you to do. And so here's Jonah having a chance to hear from God. Let's look at how he responds to God. So, so Jonah here, he's going to respond uh, to God. Verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. So Jonah arose. He went to Nineveh. So he's being obedient this time. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. So we see that God speaks to us, which is incredibly kind and gracious of him. When God speaks, you respond. When God speaks, Jonah responds. Now, he responded this time in chapter 3 in obedience, but he did respond in chapter 1. It just wasn't the best of responses. It was disobedience. Whenever we come into a session where we're hearing from God's Word through a sermon or whether you're having your own daily devotion and you're reading God's Word, all of us respond. In the same way that if, if, if my parents came and they talked to me and they asked me to do something and either I respond in obedience or I respond in stubbornness or disobedience, that's still a response. Even indifference is a response. So we always respond. It's just a matter of how do we respond. And in this moment, Jonah responds not in self-sufficiency, but he, he's, he responds in, in submission. And so, it says here that Nineveh was a three days walk. What that simply means is that the city of Nineveh, it was just as a reminder for you, at that day and time, the superpower of the day was Assyria, and their capital city was Nineveh. 
And Nineveh was just this large, sprawling city that for a man to, to walk across it, it's basically saying it would take about a three days journey. So that's an incredibly, incredibly large city, especially in that day and time. And God says, this is where I'm wanting you to go. This is what I'm wanting you to say. Also, as a reminder, Nineveh, most believe that in all of world history, Nineveh perhaps was the most brutal and violent and arrogant city that is in, in, in power that has ever existed. The things that they would do to their captors and the things that they would do to their enemies was just atrocious. And so this is the setting in which God is saying, yeah, that's where I want you to go. I want you to go into a very violent, angry, self-sufficient, self-righteous city that thinks they have all the answers and all the ideas. And this is where Jonah is going into. And he cries out this specific words, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, there's a few ideas of what's going on here because in English, that's an eight-word sermon. And some of you are like, I would love an eight-word sermon. You ain't going to get it. Um, but in the Hebrew, this is a five-word sermon. And so some people say, well, is that all that he said? And there, there's kind of three trains of, thro- of thought. One is that this is just a summary of what Jonah preached, perhaps. Others think that this may even be exactly what God told him to say, and that was it, and he's being obedient. I, I tend to think that what's happening is when Jonah preaches this very brief message, that it's revealing and reflecting Jonah's heart. This idea that, and I know none of you have ever done this with your parents or with God, I'll obey, but I'm going to do as little as possible just to get by. The whole mindset of C's get degrees. The, it, it, it's, it's something that we recognize that, that I want to do as minimum as I possibly can. And part of why I think this is the case is because it says in verse 4, Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. There's still two more days of walking to go. Like, there's still a large third of the city that's apparently not hearing this proclamation from the Lord. And Jonah's like, I guess I've done enough. It's been a day's journey, and I've shared what God wanted me to share. I've done what I needed to do. And I think I'm going to kind of pull back, and I'm going to stop here at this point. But what's interesting is, is that his sermon is definitely the not the most seeker-sensitive of sermons. Basically, he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's very much a turn or burn kind of message. Of, of, and I think Jonah might even kind of enjoy that a little bit, as we're going to see later on in Jonah chapter 4. He doesn't have a, a, a real affinity towards the Ninevites. Uh, he, he, he's kind of, I think, hoping to see that God would actually overthrow them. And, <laughs> and so what we have is, is five brief words, eight brief words, but what, what I want to tell you is that when you see that in as brief and maybe as minimal as the effort that Jonah is providing here, is some people will say, why would you proclaim a message of judgment? Why would that be the proclamation? And what I would say is this, God is kind enough and good enough to let you know that judgment is coming. I think to make a, for God to be cruel and just mean is if he didn't warn us of judgment. I saw a video the other day of, uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 at a baseball game, it was just this really violent act of apparently some fan was yelling at another fan in a baseball stadium, and as he was yelling at this guy, and this guy was yelling back at him, eventually, young guy over here, he gets up and he just walks over to this guy, he doesn't say anything, he's stone cold, and he just walks up and he just clocks this guy and knocks him out. No warning at all, just judgment. <laughs> God's not just going to rear back and just punch us out. He's good enough and kind enough to say, you can escape my judgment because I'm being kind enough to let you know it's coming. Respond appropriately so that it doesn't come, so that, that it doesn't take place. So these Eight-word sermon in English, five-word sermon in, in the Hebrew, I find incredibly kind and, and incredibly gracious. And, and it makes me think of what, what eight words you could share with your one. What five words could you share with someone in your life that would forever affect them and move them and, and alter their life? For some of you, you, you've heard maybe not even five words or eight words, maybe even less. There's a huge difference, and I have friends of mine that had grown up that 
it wasn't uncommon for me to hear from my family, Stephen, you're smart. And it wasn't uncommon for me to go to someone else's family and say to their son or daughter, what are you, stupid? And it stuck with them. It affected them as they go on in their life with just confidence and just who they are. I had the ability to be raised in a home where I say, I, I love you. And I've been in other homes where the parent, maybe even jokingly, would say, who could possibly love you? And, and it, it just makes you step back and go, that's what you want to speak into your child's life, and that is going to affect them. I, I've, I've heard this with so many, specifically in working with, with, with young adults, I've heard people say, when are you going to get married? And it's like, well, I, I desire it. It's a desire in my heart. I want to get married. Versus... Someone coming into your life and saying, I'm glad that you have a high biblical standard and you're not, you're not bowing down to the cultural norms of cohabitating and living together and just having whatever kind of life that you want to have. You have a standard that is God and His Word. But instead, what we say is, mm, just when are you going to get married? Jonah responds to this truth in, in just in an incredible fashion of obedience, but also it seems to be a bit of, of, of reluctance. That's his response. Look at Nineveh's response. Number three, Nineveh responds. Look at verse five. It says, and the people of Nineveh believed in God. If, if you have a hard copy, you can underline believe. We're going to come back to that. It says, and the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Again, just like with Jonah, when God speaks, you respond. It can be indifference. It can be disobedience. But we see in this moment, the Ninevites, they, they respond in repentance. They respond in humbling themselves to the word of the Lord that has come into their life. Oftentimes, we think of the great miracle that occurs within the book of Jonah is maybe the storm in chapter 1 pursuing Jonah, or especially most often when we think of the book of Jonah, we think of the fish. But the reality is that the great miracle in the book of Jonah is in, is in chapter 3, is the fact that the Ninevites are wicked, vile, brutal people. These are literally the ancestors of future ISIS and the Taliban. And these are the, the ones that God is coming along and saying, no, 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 no. If you will turn from your wickedness to me, I will relent from the judgment and the consequence that's going to come upon you. And it says in verse 5, the very first thing that they do is that they believe. It's this, it's this notion of faith faith, that they believe what God is going to say is what God is going to do, so we need to respond in some form or fashion. This, this, is, this, is, this is something that within the life of the church, we, hopefully you have grown up in this, that for you to experience the saving grace of God in your life, for you to have salvation, it's not based on anything that we can do. It's based upon what Christ did on the cross and then us responding to his sacrifice of, his, of our sin upon that cross and his defeat of sin through the resurrection from the grave. But what we do is we see what God has done and we respond by believing in him and repenting. What we have is we have the Ninevites, their belief also moves them to action. I'm eager to see in the life of the church that our belief in Jesus makes us act and behave differently, that we're moved to action of what He has called us to do and who He has called us to be because belief affects our actions. The Ninevites didn't just merely have some kind of mental assent to God, but they humbled their heart and their mind in an attitude that moved them to action because they didn't only respond to God mentally, do you notice they responded to him emotionally, spiritually, physically? 
even the king. Imagine some of our political leaders getting on, on, on the internet or getting onto Instagram or getting onto the ABC News or NBC News and saying, it's time for us to repent. Get in sackcloth and ashes. It's time for us to have a proclamation of we need to turn from our ways and turn toward him and his, <laughs> his ways. The reality is, is the irony of the situation here is in Jonah chapter 1 and 2, the man of God needed a storm and a fish to repent. The wicked, vile, brutal, arrogant Ninevites just needed the word of the Lord, and they responded. <laughs> they just needed these eight words or these five words. In some ways, I believe, as Jonah is writing and recounting what he experienced, this is intended to, to shame us, the people of God. It's also to remind us that sometimes the people that we think are the furthest from God might just be the most receptive to the things of God. Again, I go back to who your one is. Some of you have someone who's been heavy on your heart for a long time, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, and you're like, I'll write their name down. I guess I'll pray for them occasionally, but there's just no way that God could get a hold of this guy. There's just no way that God could get a hold of this lady. I guarantee you, all Israelites would have thought there's no way, one, that God would want to be gracious enough to show grace and mercy to the Ninevites, and two, even if he does, none of them would respond. They're so stuck in their ways and in their thinking and in their lifestyle, and yet we see them respond to the grace and the mercy of God. Truly, this, this section, verses 5 through 9, is a picture and a definition of repentance, of the Ninevites throwing themselves at the mercy of God. Again, though they are violent and brutal and arrogant, they are broken and they are messed up. God sends someone to them because God is a God of compassion. God is a God of mercy and grace. And He calls on all of us, all of us, that we would be sent to the broken and to the violent and to the messed up. The reality is, is He sent someone to you. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, it's because someone spoke the word and the gospel of Jesus into your life. You were messed up, and it took someone else who was messed up, who experienced the grace of God, to no longer know what that messed up is. The reality is, is that in, in my life, I had my parents that I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home where I heard the gospel, and I heard the good news of Jesus, and I grew up in the church, and I knew the reality of who Jesus is. But it takes a community, if you will. My dad is preaching a sermon out of the book of Revelation, and I feel like I'm needing to respond to it, and I'm sitting there in that pew in this church, and I look at my, one of my older brothers, Jeff, and I'm like, I feel like I need to go talk to dad. I need to respond to what I've heard today from, from dad's preaching, from the word of God, and what I end up doing is I end up making my way to, to, to just uh, realizing that... You good? Is that better? Okay. Now i got to use one hand. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> but the beauty of it is, <laughs> it's not that funny, Dad. Um, <laughs> but the beauty of it is, 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 the, is the fact that for, for me to hear and respond to the gospel, my dad preached the message. My brother encouraged me to respond to that message. And then I had that afternoon to speak with my mom and my dad in their bedroom about what it is to come to know Christ. But the, the story didn't stop there. My oldest brother then in high school began to disciple me about continuing to walk in the Word of God. It took people who, no offense, who were messed up in their own sin and experienced the grace of God to come into my life who is messed up so that I can know the grace of God by their sharing it with me. You are a part of that chain. Someone poured into you, we pour into someone else. And then we allow God to deal with that person, allow God to save them. Every person in this room who is called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, you came because you heard the word of, the God, the word of God, the gospel of God, and you responded. Maybe he was a parent. Maybe he was a teacher, a coach, or a sibling, a pastor, a camp counselor, but someone spoke to you. Last thing, number four, verse 10, God responds. As I told you before, God gets the last word. Verse 10, it says, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. 
The beauty of it is this, is that when Nineveh responded, God's response was that he relented. Some of your translations, and I don't don't think it's the best translation, might say repent. Um, I think the better translation is, is relent. And the reason why I say that is this, is that Sometimes when people have studied this passage, especially, uh, specifically in King James, the word repent is there, and we think of changing or changing of a mind. And so the question has been asked, well, can God change his mind? But we find from another prophet in the book of Malachi, he says that God does not change. And there's this big fancy theological term that's called the immutability of God, or the fact that God does not change. God can neither um, improve or diminish. He just is. He is eternally good, self-existent, loving. That's just who he is. So when it says that God relented, this isn't demonstrating that God changed, but, but rather that the Ninevites changed. Uh, it, it's not that God changes, it's that man changes. Because the reality is, is that if we respond to the word of the Lord and, and we don't come in repentance, then we can experience either God as lion or as lamb. We can either experience him as judgment or we can experience him as the sacrifice on our behalf. It all depends upon how we respond to him. I, I just want to give you just a, a biblical example. I think it'll be up on the screen, but I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter 18. In Jeremiah chapter 18, listen to this. It says at one moment, I might speak, this is God speaking, I, God, might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring upon it. Essentially, just what he's saying is, is, is if you'll respond in repentance, then my heart's desire is that I will relent from what it is that I was going to do. I was going to bring consequence. He goes on and he says, or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. So he's even saying, if you have been obedient but then you begin to turn from me. I was going to bless, but now that's going to be taken away. There's going to be consequence for for your sin. What we find is that God remains true to himself and to his word and just to his character of who he is. He doesn't change in our dealings with us. We change in our dealings with him. Example of this. Some of you maybe have been at the airport with those walking tracks, and uh, the walking tracks are fun to jump on, and you're able to kind of either just stand there and it just kind of takes you kind of that horizontal just level escalator or you can walk on it and you can go really fast every once in a while you get a funny guy who thinks i'm going to walk the other way and he's going against that walking track and what you find is that it's much more difficult to go against the grain than it is to go with the grain another example is this idea of like a current last year tiffany and i had the opportunity to go to the ocean and we like to go paddle boarding and The guy was letting us know it's pretty choppy. There's a strong current out there. If you're not careful, you can get caught in the current, and it's going to take you on to Cuba. So Tiffany went first, and she had her glasses off so she couldn't see at all because she's blind as a bat, and she gets onto that paddleboard, and she makes her way out there. She's doing a great job. Her main focus, don't fall. Just don't fall. And she realizes, I've been rowing this way for a long time or paddling this way for a long time. I'm not really getting anywhere. So she turns her, her, her paddleboard and she begins to go this way. And I kid you not, I had to run down the beach to catch her because the current just took her. Here's the point of that. When we go against the things of God, the current of God, it's just going to be a difficult upward battle against him. But God in his goodness says, if you will turn in that current and repent and go with me, I will take you to some incredible places. I will take you and experience some incredible things. It may be difficult and it may even be hard, but, but quit fighting against me. Turn and I will relent. Or I won't re- I'll relent, but you're going to now begin to go, to go with me. So each one of us is in that current against God and the things of God, but God is good. God will relent his judgment and the consequences of our sin. God's perfectly righteous and just to judge our sin, but he chose to pursue us with his grace. And he doesn't just simply wave a wand and dismiss our sin, but rather he sent his son, Jesus, to absorb the wrath and the judgment of our sin, what was due our sin. And and the question may come is, well, how? How do we experience 
the wrath of God and the judgment of our sin to where God would relent in what he should do towards us. And, and the answer is the same as it was in Genesis, as it is in Jonah, as it is in Romans, and as it is today. I, I told you in, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, there was the word believe. It's literally the word amen, and it's the word that you think of, amen. And, and it's that word of so be it. Yes, I agree. It's the same word that is used in Genesis with the story of Abraham. Abraham is one of the, 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 the big guys in the Old Testament. And what we find in Abraham's life in Genesis 15, it says that Abraham believed, or amen, he believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Because he believed what God said, he had faith to believe that what God said would be so, yes, amen, so be it, I agree, I fall in line with you, then God says, that credits you as righteousness. It's the same word here used about the Ninevites. They believed in God. Their faith in God. They're agreeing with what God is saying. God's saying, if you don't turn in 40 days, you're going to burn. And so they say, I believe that, and so I'm going to respond to that so that perhaps you will relent from that judgment and consequence. Same is true in the book of Romans, chapter 4. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 4, 5. But the one who does not know work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Paul uses the exact same word to justify by, by faith alone. I just want to finish with this. I've made the comment that, that God speaks, we respond, and then God extends. God responds to our response by either extending his grace and his mercy in our life, or he responds by consequence and judgment upon our sin because for him to remain who he is, that's what he has to do. And so this is what I want you to do this morning as we have a time of response. You may have noticed that over the last several months since I've been here, we have a time that we call a time of response. And it's intentionally actually because of this. I grew up in a church where we had invitations. It's the same idea, but... but I like using the terminology, a time of response, because if God of the universe has spoken from his word and through the example of Jonah and these Ninevites, and we just go about our day and say, oh, interesting story, good for them, what do we eat? And we don't take the time to respond, then I feel like we've missed perhaps one of the most essential aspects of our worship time. It, to me, it's, it's a time where we, we really key in and we really focus in the Lord. If God has spoken through His Word, I would ask you this morning, how will you respond? Is it indifference? Is it boredom? Or is it, God, what are you saying to me? Because I believe that God deserves, He desires, and He demands a response from all of us this morning. So the three things that I want to invite you to do in our time of response is, one, to pray, and then do what the Ninevites did, believe and repent. For some of you as a follower of Jesus, you might be saying, I need to believe uh, and, and repent. I need to believe again in the things of God and the Word of God and submit to it, and I need to turn from what I've been doing in my life, and I need to get back on track and in current with Him, quit going against Him. But for others of you, it might be that this is a time where you recognize that I have really no concern or care for anything with the things of God or the people of God. I'm not one of you guys. I'm not a follower of Jesus. It's, he's, he's fine. He's a good teacher. But perhaps maybe today you're hearing the reality that unless you respond to God's grace and mercy and repentance, that if you don't respond in repentance, His response to you will have to be justice and judgment and consequence of your sin. And I believe that's not his heart's desire. His heart's desire is to see you saved from his wrath. And that's why he sent his son. So if you would, I want to invite you to stand. What we're going to do is we're going to sing. And during this time as we sing, again, I invite you to pray. I invite you to believe. I invite you to repent. But ultimately, what I'm inviting you to do is respond to the word of the Lord today, however you need. If you need to visit with someone, I'd be more than happy. I'll be standing right there to visit with you, to pray with you.
But this is your time to respond to the Lord and what he had to say today to you. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to Just a handful of things I wanted to mention to you before we're dismissed. Um, as, as Dalton mentioned earlier, there's a, a team of us that are going to be going to the Dominican Republic at the end of July. And part of us uh, announcing that to you so early is uh, we want to give you an opportunity to know who that team is, um, but also to be praying for them. That's something that we want to ask that you begin doing now. And then for others of you, you may have a desire to not just support us through prayer, but also in financial support. Uh, in the month of May, we're, what we're emphasizing is if you would like to help offset some of the costs for the individuals to be able to go on that trip, that in the month of May, if, if you would like to give to that, that we are encouraging to do so. But then in the month of June, as we begin to have a little bit more focus of what our trip is going to specifically entail, then we're able to kind of let you know, here are some specific uh, needs that we have, whether it's construction materials or Bibles or whatever it is. And that's what the month of June will be designed for if you'd like to help out in those ways. But we encourage you to, uh, to be a part of it. As I've mentioned to you before, it's not just, here's a group that's going, it's this is your group representing you that is going and that uh, we want to support them in that. Uh, the other is the 
the gospel conversation uh, training seminar that we've been promoting the last several weeks, uh, it got changed just a little bit. We still encourage you to go, but instead of being a Monday and Tuesday, this Monday, tomorrow, and Tuesday, they've moved it to just a Monday morning session, and they're going to double up, do everything that morning uh, from Monday morning from about 9 o'clock to about 12.30. Lunch will be provided, but we've just stressed encouraging this because of who's your one and uh, the different things that we're going to be doing here in the next couple of weeks that that is, it's good to have that training so that it becomes a little bit more natural for you and just the reminding of the repetition of, of trying to just begin those conversations with people, to have a gospel conversation. And so if you are interested in wanting to be a part of that, you can still register. Uh, we encourage you to do so. If you say, uh, I'm not sure how to, to register, uh, I don't have you know smartphone or whatever it is, come and visit with me and I will get you registered so that way you can know. It's at Northside Baptist Church. It's going to be tomorrow morning again from 9 to about 12.30, and, and I would urge you to go uh, because a common question people that will ask me is, how could I better share my faith? Go to this and, and allow, allow this guy, Sam Greer, to be able to give you some encouragement and some tools that you can take with you. And then the final thing is, as, as you guys, as we did before, praying for who's our one. The whole point behind that is we're trying to encourage you that for June 13th, uh, or the weekend of June 12th, Saturday, and June 13th on Sunday, that whole weekend we're trying to accomplish two different things, uh, similar to what we kind of see modeled with Jesus. On June 12th, we're having a Mission Point community cookout at Barfield Crescent Park. It's going to be from about 11 to about 2. That is a, a big event that we want to do to invite everybody in that we possibly can. Invite your neighbors, your coworkers, everybody to that. It doesn't just need to be who your one is, but it's just a chance for us to love on our community, let them know that we are here, that we, that we care. We'll invite them to come worship with us the next day. The, the beauty of this is a lot of people are like, oh, I couldn't make it Sunday. I'm out of town. If they're here on Saturday, they're probably still in town the next day. So we want to encourage them to be a part of our worship service on Sunday, because on Sunday, June 13th, that's the day that we are urging and encouraging all of you that whoever your one is, that if you can get them here, they will hear the gospel proper. They will hear of how they can come to faith in Christ. It'll be a very evangelistic, uh, gospel-centered message that we want to present to them. So as you're proclaiming to them who Jesus is, also invite them in. I think some great ways in which you can do that is you can say, I'll pick you up, or meet me there, and I will take you to lunch afterwards. And we want to just encourage you to get your one into this place. And then for some of you, your one, maybe someone who lives far off, encourage them to join our live stream uh, and then say, hey, I'll visit with you afterwards and just kind of get your thoughts and your ideas of, of what we heard that day. And just to begin and continue that conversation. Last thing I want to mention, then we're going we're gonna to pray, is if, if you do remember to do so, I would ask and encourage you to continue to pray for Doug and Janice. Doug is one of our elders, and he and his wife Janice, over the course of the month of May, they have had a, a pretty difficult month as far as grief and as far as loss. Um, Doug's stepfather had passed away. They had the service yesterday. Uh, Janice's father had passed away and then also kind of did a duel of remembering her mom who had passed away the previous year. So this has just been a very heavy month for them. They're traveling and on their way back into town today. And I would just ask and encourage you to, to pray for them as you think about them. Um, send them a note of encouragement, as I know that you guys have done for, for me and Tiffany, and it, it means the world. And so pray for them. Just, just love on them as they've been going through a pretty difficult time of just loss and grief. But I just wanted to mention that to you before we go today. So let me pray for us, and we will be dismissed and look forward to seeing you guys. Uh, actually, I won't see you guys next week. <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a guest come in and preach next week. I'll be out of town next week, uh, actually with my family. Um, but I uh, wanted to um, definitely encourage you to be here next weekend and hear our, our guest preacher and to worship together. But let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this church family. And uh, Lord, I do pray that that when we come into a place like this or when we meet with you in the morning or in the afternoon or at evening, Lord, in our own time in your word, that, Father, we, we wouldn't just want to have uh, information that's coming in, that we're not just wanting just to be able to take what we have and explain it to someone, uh, but, Father, that we're wanting to be changed as a result of hearing from you and then just sharing the, the, the joy of what we've experienced with those that are around us. Um, and Father, I know at times in our lives, in my life, it, it can be difficult because someone may ask a question and I want to give an explanation, but Lord, I pray 
that more than anything, that we would just give them your word and your revelation and then walk along with them as far as what it means and what you have to say. And so, Lord, uh, I just thank you again for this church family. I pray your blessings upon them as we go out into this week. Help us to be mindful of that one that you've placed on our heart and on our mind. And may we lift them up to you daily. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You are, you are dismissed.